That last line reminds me of a scenario in the life of David after he had taken the kingdom and finally become the king of the of the whole uh, of the north and the south. And uh, he asks, "Is there anyone that I might show kindness to, for the sake of Saul, for the sake of Jonathan?" And and he's told about Mephibosheth. Remember Mephibosheth? He was lame on his feet. He had been dropped as a child. They didn't have the care and those things. And so he was lame on his feet. And David says, go get Mephibosheth. He was once of the household. He's out of the household of Saul. Once your enemy. But now seated at your table. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth was thinking when, when David says, come. I want you to live in my house. I want you to eat at my table to spend time with me. From this point forward and forever. And I want to bless you. I want to give you back all of your grandfather's or your father's lands and your grandfather's lands. I'm going to give you servants because you're going to be with me. What was Jonathan or what was Mephibosheth's response to that? It had to be Thanksgiving. It had to be an awe of God and what God had done for him. In fact, later on, when David had to flee the kingdom and uh and when he comes back in, he finds that Mephibosheth had done nothing to take care of himself while David was gone. And he said, well, I've given your houses and lands, David said to your servant. And he said, I don't care about that stuff. I just want to know that you're okay. I just want to be with you. And that our response, isn't that a great response? I don't care about all the other things. God, I just want you. I get to dwell at your table. To be called by your name. Well, that's not what I'm preaching on this morning. That was just a little bit of a. Sorry there. I got thinking about it while we were singing. And, and was enjoying that. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. Verses 7 to 17. And uh, today being the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Um, as we continue to work our way through this series on foundations. Um, I want to this morning look at the aspect of worship. And I want to enlarge our estimation, our view, and understanding of God. And so that we would worship and praise Him. This past Wednesday in our small group, um, uh, we took some time to, to share a favorite psalm or a verse that inspires you to, to worship and to praise God and makes you think about that. And some of the ones that were shared, I'm going to throw up on the screen here. We, we shared Psalm 24. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast. The Lord, the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And then verse eight says, oh, taste and see the Lord is good. What a great verse. What a great passage. Another one that was mentioned was Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Now, maybe that'll spark your thinking, because part of what I want to do tonight at our Thanksgiving meal is just to give praise and thanks to God. And so maybe you'll come with just a, a verse or a psalm like that to say, hey, I want to share just what God has done for me. And so you'll get a chance to do some of that tonight as well at our Thanksgiving meal. And, um, but just what a great God that we serve. And so I want to look at where does worship come into play in scripture and how do we say that as a foundational element? Because really when we think of those verses and we, we read an entire book, the Psalms, there's a whole emphasis that is woven into the fabric of God's people. And that is the fabric of, or the, the, the emphasis of worship. What is worship? The Westminster Shorter Catechism says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so worship is foundational mankind. I don't know if that's, I think that's me here. Maybe I have too many layers on and I don't know. It's definitely on the pack. Let me just loosen that a little bit and see if that'll help. I like John MacArthur's simple definition of worship, where he said it this way. He said, worship is all that we are reacting rightly to all that he is. So when we grasp all that he is, 
And not only that I would even beyond, go beyond that, not only to all that he is, but all that he has done. Then we respond rightly with all that we are. The problem is we often think of worship in the realm only of singing or music. And worship goes well beyond that. Um, we were talking actually in our family devotions on that. One of the questions that one of the kids asked was, well, what does worship look like? It's a good question. What does worship look like? Because we often think of it only in that church music setting. But when we are gearing our hearts and, and studying his word and we're, we're observing who he is and in awe of him, is that not worship? When we have a desire to please him and, and we, we obey his word and we do what's right, is that not worship? When we, when we, when we love our spouses, when we, when we do those things that are pleasing the Lord, that is worship because we're responding rightly with all that we have to all that he is and what he has done. And so it's, again, it's woven into the fabric of God's people. Now, the reality is, is on this Thanksgiving day, I want to give you a little bit of a brief history because it's not only woven there, it's woven into our U.S. history. I'm going to give you a little bit of just a short, brief history history lesson. A lot of this you probably have learned and are aware of and have known since you were in grade school. I think it's helpful for us to just to think about that foundation of worship even as a country. A lot of this comes from William Blatt, Bradford's uh, testimony, eyewitness testimony in, of Plymouth Plantation. And um, he talks about that in the early 15 or the late 1500s and the early 1600s that persecution and um, religious persecution began to start to ramp up in Europe. And some felt the church, there was two really different beliefs or sections. There was some who felt the church could be kind of saved from that and it could be purified and they could make some changes. They could purify the church and that was the Puritans. There was another group that said, no, the, the, the Catholic church and the Church of England is too far gone from the word of God and they've, become, they've abandoned those things and so there's a need to separate, and that was the separatists. Those are the ones that we're really focused on. We think about the, the pilgrims coming over. That was the separatists. So there was two really groups of separatists that were in England at the time, and they determined, we've got to get out of here. And so even though it was illegal to emigrate out of the country, they snuck out of the country and fled to Holland, Leiden, Holland, in, in 1608. And they were there for some time, for 11 years they were in Holland, and, um, and actually William Bradford was a teenager at the time, an older teenager, and he helped them to flee from England and get to Leiden, Holland. There they established and grew with the church that was there already in existence. There was a, a pastor by the name of John Robinson, and the church was growing. Uh, they grew to about 300 members, but the the, the living conditions for those who emigrated into Holland were difficult. It was hard to make a living. And also there was a concern for the, uh, the, the moral situation, condition of Holland and how it was affecting their children. And so after some time, 46 members of that congregation in Holland determined that they wanted to leave Holland and go back to England to sail over to the New World where they could establish a a community that would be religiously free, but also uh, would be free from the moral um, uh, dangers that were to their children. And so they joined then with, um, with, an, with the additional uh, people who came over to the, the new land. There was a total of 104 that came over. And, um, and, and so the, the trip was hard. It took them nine weeks um, to, to travel over from September 6th to the beginning of November. When they arrived in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, things were a lot harder than they had expected. They weren't prepared for the harsh winter. They weren't prepared with living conditions and food. And in that first winter in, in the New World, half, over half of the pilgrims died. Four entire families died. There was only four families in the entire community that did not have a death amongst their family in that first winter. It was a hard existence. In addition, 18 of the 30 women of childbearing age died in that first winter. 
But God was working providentially in all of this. Uh, during their time in Leiden, Holland, God had taken a, uh, a, 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 an Indian that had gotten captured from the New World there and had gone over, been captured as a, as a slave and sold in Spain. There was a group of Spanish monks who uh, wanted to take care of them. And so he, he was taken by them and was taught and was trained in the English. Um, and then later on, he made his way back to the New World in 1619, only to find that the rest of his tribe had been uh, had, had been decimated, had been killed because of a plague. So there's Squanto. He's, he's by himself. He's wondering, this new God that he'd been hearing about, what could he be doing in his life? Why would he take him over to England and to Spain and then back to the New World and, and his, his tribe is gone? But about that same time, within six months, he met the pilgrims. And he was there to help speak in English. He was there to help translate between them and the Indians to help uh, form some treaties. He was there to help them learn how to plant crops and where to find uh, good fishing grounds and areas to hunt and those things. And so after that first harvest, the, the pilgrims determined that, they had had a, that God had been good to them. Even though they had lost so many lives in that first winter, they had a, a good first harvest and God had been blessing them. So they determined, William Bradford, who was then helping to lead the people determined that they should have a day of thanksgiving, lifting up joyous celebration to God. And so they invited the Indians. They went out and, and killed many of the different birds. It talks about they went out of fowling. They also killed six deer together and then had a great feast to celebrate and to thank God. A day that's been set aside in our country since its existence to thank God for his goodness. To praise him for who he is. But really, so it's woven into the fabric of our country as a people. But really, it's woven into way beyond that. As we talked about, it's woven into the very foundation of mankind. We go to Genesis chapter 2. And we read that early in verses 7 to 17. And we see that this is a part of, of mankind. Is the ability and the call and the need to worship. We're going to break that down in a moment. But think about this. We talked about last week how that Adam was created on the sixth day. And the seventh day was a day of rest. So his very first day of existence was a day to meditate on God, to spend time with God. A day to, to be in awe of all of, this, all of the creation that God had made in those first six days. And his response is one of worship and thanksgiving. And I want to demonstrate that from our, our text this morning. Let's have a quick word of prayer and then we'll jump in together. Father, I pray that you'd guide our time. I pray that you'd help us to, to see you afresh, to see how you've created us and you are so good. Your desire for us is to be able to know you and to walk with you and have fellowship and your desire is to take care of us, to provide us peace. And Lord, I pray as we observe these things from the text and the observation that we have the ability to choose to worship you may we choose to be thankful may we choose to to lift up your name and to glorify it Lord, we love you thank you for giving us your son jesus christ to die on the cross for our sins that we might know you through him that's your name we pray amen well, just three simple points this morning. The first one is I want you to notice that man is designed for worship. I'm going to take this off and maybe that'll help. I don't know that it will. Um, but in verse chapter, in verse number seven there, we see the kind of a, a breakout of a little bit explanation of, uh, of how God made man. It says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. There's just a, a, a detail to the personal nature that's given to us in verse 7 of how God made us. In fact, there's different words that are used in Genesis 1 about how God made stuff and created stuff. There's the word that is the word that's given for when he created. So God creates the word bere. 
it means to create from nothing. And there is, there's, there's parts of creation that are done that way. But other times it uses a word that is, mean that he took what was created already and he from that made something. And so he made that. And the word, that'd be the word in the Hebrew, the asa. But when it comes to this verse, for the very first time in scripture, we find that God uses a different word in what he does for man. It's the word yatsar. And what that word means is when it says, and the Lord God formed man. It has the detail of an intimate creator who's taking and, and shaping and fashioning just like a, a potter does on the wheel. And he, he forms the clay. He molds it in the shape he desires and the fashion he desires. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And none of the else of creation does it speak like that except for man. And none of the else of the creation does it use the, the, the double night title for God as well. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. What a care and compassion that he has in that. And so we see there, there's this, there's this serious concern for man. But then it goes beyond that and says, and he, it says that he created man. And then it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, what I want you to see here is that this is not simply the filling of the lungs. Not just simply him giving air to man to be, make him alive. It has a spiritual significance to it. it. It allows man to have the breath of God bring spiritual understanding and a functioning conscience. To be able to see and comprehend the goodness of God. Let me give you two verses that, that demonstrate that this is more than simply kind of a suscitation to bring to life physically, but it also has a spiritual coming to life. In, in Job verse 32 and verse in chapter 32, verse 8, it says, But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. God has given to man. The ability to understand him, to comprehend God so that we are able to say, wow, God, you are awesome. Wow, I see your holiness and I can see who you are. We are given that ability because he breathed into man by the breath of God. We are given understanding. Proverbs 20 verse 27 says the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart. I apologize that this thing is. Giving little fits there. That's the ability to have not only spiritual life, but moral capability. That we can understand right and wrong and understand who God is. Man in his core foundational state is given the capability to know God. To comprehend him, to, to dwell on him, to, to have fellowship with him. And are capable then of worshiping him. That's distinctive only to man. That we are given this capability to know him and worship him in relation that way. In fact, I want you to turn to Psalm 95 for a second. And Psalm 95 is just a, uh, an, a great psalm of worship. As we're seeing man's capability and we're seeing throughout the, 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 the ages of God's people... We have this beautiful psalm of praise. The psalmist writes, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. You see that recognition of the psalmist? God, you made us. And we can observe that. We can see all that you're do you have done. Man is given that distinct ability. Man is designed for worship. But secondly, then. 
I want you to notice in the following verses that man is delighted for worship. And what I mean by that is we start to see God's goodness to man. In fact, the word Eden means delight. So we're going to see God takes and makes the garden of Eden and, and puts God there. And so they are delighted by God's goodness to worship. Look at verse 8. As it continues there, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So he, he takes and he, he fashions man. And by the way, the word garden there, um, in, in the Greek translation, it's the word paradisios, from which we get our word paradise. That, that God made a paradise. And he named it Eden, which means delight. And, and so, so wherever Adam is in this or pre-diluvian state and condition to the east of that god makes this beautiful place for him to dwell in and, and so it seems that this planting of the garden which is still on the sixth day of creation he does after he makes man and so adam in a sense gets to observe that god is making this place for him He's putting every tree and all this beauty that is there for him and he witnessed this and then god takes him and puts them in the garden of eden the point i'm making is adam saw god's loving hand of blessing up close he, he knew that god is good and loving and that's important for us to stop and to recognize in our lives if we're truly going to be thankful if we're truly going to be worshipful to stop and observe what god has done for us have you taken the time to just to look at what God has done in your life, his blessings, to see how he's faithful, to see who he is. And so Adam is able to see all that. And then it expands into and says, out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, who is it pleasant for? It's for Adam. God delighted in, God desired to give to Adam things that were pleasurable. He gave him, God didn't need there to be for himself trees that were good for food or pleasurable to the eyes. But for Adam's sake, he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this beautiful types of trees, all these different flowering trees and, and these, these huge uh, cypress trees and, and deciduous trees with all the different colors of the fall and all those things. And Adam, it's just for you to enjoy. Pleasant to the eyes. Just so you'll say, wow, isn't this nice? I get to spend time in what God has made. <laughs> Have you taken any time this fall to walk out in the woods? The leaves are down now. But have you ever taken time to go out there and just to see the variety and the beauty of God's creation? I mean, to see the different p tall pine trees that are out there. I like the evergreens. And, and then to see, we, we've got in our backyard some massive oak trees. And, um, and, and just to see that as they drop their leaves and, and the colors of that. When we were on our honeymoon, we ended up going out to Sequoia National Park and seeing the massive redwood trees. You can, you can drive a car through some of them because they're, they're so big. God made all of that. And he says, I'm going to put every single amazing and beautiful and wonderful tree in the garden for you to enjoy. And, and everything that, is, that, that produces fruit, all the wonderful fruits there, I'm going to give them to you, Adam. Just so you can have it, you can enjoy that. Man, God is so good to him. And so we see that and we are delighted by all that. And then, and then we're, we're told about two other trees, specific trees. And it says there, the, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, and so we have these two trees. I just want to just for a moment mention them quickly. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, the tree of life was a tree that eating from it enabled men to live forever. We don't exactly know how or what was involved with that. But after sin came, this tree was guarded. And then when the flood came, it was destroyed. And we don't find it again until the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem in Revelation 
22 verse 2 bearing 12 different kinds of fruit for each of the seasons to enjoy and man will live forever um, and so there's the the tree of the of of life but then there's also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that often seems elusive to us so what do we know about it well chapter 3 verse 6 says it was good for food it was pleasant it was a good looking tree now sometimes people ask well what kind of fruit was it so, some say was it an apple a lot of you know a lot of times when you see like you know kids story books you've got eve handing an apple to to adam was it an apple in fact the, that theory comes in um, or that that thinking comes in because of the colloquial term for a man's uh, large larynx the, the voice box referred to as the adam's apple and the story behind that is that Adam, when he ate it, a part of that apple got stuck in his throat. Um, and I'm not kidding. This is where this, that's why we call it the Adam's apple. And so it was there as a reminder uh, to him of the, the forbidden fruit that he ate. Now, we, we know that that's just a story. Uh, first of all, that if someone chokes on food, their kids don't have that same, that same thing that doesn't pass down. Um, and, and no one has ever become the wiser because of eating an apple. Um, but, uh, so it kind of debunks the, the apple the tree theory, but, but it is a beautiful tree. And, and so sometimes you'll ask, well, is there any kind of a, a chemical nature of this tree that, that it somehow enabled man to, to know things? I, I personally just believe that it was an option of choice. And if man chose to disobey God, that they would then understand a difference between good and evil. They would start to recognize the fall and all of that. And so I don't think the physical object is the issue. I think the spiritual and the heart issue is the issue. Um, but look at verses 10 through 14. It says also, as we see the beauty of this garden that God delighted to put Adam in, Adam and Eve, it says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It's the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah and where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, but uh, Bedellium and the Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It's the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is Hittikel. It's the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, why would God give us such detail on on this river than where it's breaking out to in all these four different rivers. I mean, this is, uh, we don't technically, even though some of the names have carried on into our modern day, we, we have a Euphrates River and we have some of these that are labeled today. We, we know from 1 Peter, uh, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, that, that the world or features of that time period before the flood were perished. And so, None of that would necessarily be an effect for us today. But why so much detail then? I think what it's there to describe for us is the beauty of God's creation. And this river that flows through this garden to water this garden is so magnificent, so large, that it from there sends out to four different rivers, which really feed four different areas and lands of the earth. That tells us that this garden is massive it's a large beautiful awesome place with this massive river flowing out of the midst of it feeding and watering all the trees and the plants and all of that the beauty and splendor of this place that god made just to bless adam and eve it says there that he planted the garden he made everything in there and he took Adam, hey, I got a place for you. Adam, hey, I know we had a great day yesterday, you know, and spending some time together, but I got a place where I want you to dwell. I've got it ready for you. Hey, Adam, come here. And they walk from the west to the east, we don't know where, to Eden. He says, let me show you this place. Uh, you know how like in movies, they've got like the secret door into the garden type of thing. I often wonder like, was there that? Like God said, hey, I've been hiding this. Let me show you, pulls back this door and like opens up to this massive garden. He says, I, I made all this stuff for you, Adam. 
every tree. You can eat whatever you want of here, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat that one. But you can have everything, everything else. You can enjoy this, this river, all the animals that are inhabiting this place. Do, do you like it, Adam? I mean, God loves to bless his people. God delights in making you delighted. You say, well, that seems kind of narcissistic. Not if God says it. Not if the Bible reveals that that's how, who our God is. But what it ought to do is reframe our thinking to say, wow, God, I'm not worthy of this. God, you are so good. Blessed be your name. I lift up my voice to you. I want to live for you. I want to praise you with my life because you are so good to me. Man, you are so good to me. I don't understand why you're so good to me, but thank you. Thank you for being my God. That's exactly what we have here. And he takes Adam in there and he even gives him things to do. He, he gives him a job to tend and to keep the land. That's a blessing by the way the foundation of work is found right here in the garden of eden work is not the curse it's a blessing to be productive and to do something uh, it became harder after the fall but god says i want you to tend it i want you to keep this you're going to be productive in this place and, and adam I, i'm going to bless you with this so we see man is designed for worship man is delighted through the blessings of god for worship it gears our hearts towards that but then thirdly and lastly man is decisive for worship man is decisive for worship now so we ought to stop and think about god what have you done for me as i look back on my life i see your blessings your hand in my life greater love is no man than this and that a man laid down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. You know what word sticks out to me there? Friends. God calls us friends. That he laid down his life for his friends. You start to think about what God has done for you. And it delights us. But then it moves into that man is decisive for worship. Notice verse 16 and 17. And so we see that verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, so all of that good. And then here he gives man one prohibition. He said, well, that seems restrictive. No, it's actually for our good. Let me, let, me, let me read for you a comment that I came across by Klaus Westermann. He's a, a late German Old Testament scholar. And um, he pointed this out. He said that this prohibition in no way means that the man will be deprived of anything. It actually enlarges his potential. For by hearing it and obeying it, the man stands in a new relationship with the one giving the command. If God hadn't given this prohibition, we would stand in a, in a different type of relationship with God because we would be almost robotic and unable. In other words, we would be, some, some people say, well, that, was Adam not able to not worship? No, he was able to choose to worship or to not worship. He was able to choose to obey and, and glorify God or to not do so. And so, I apologize, that's driving me crazy. The reality is an, an automaton cannot love its maker or even truly worship and to glorify and to fellowship with him the same. And so God desired more for man. And so in order to do so, he gave man this prohibition. And so what we see is that a genuine love relationship is a reciprocal relationship and true worship and glory must be a moral choice god gives man a free will to love and glorify god and therefore we are free to, to not love and not glorify god 
You have a choice. God doesn't make you worship Him. God doesn't make you have to glorify Him. He doesn't make it impossible so that you can't, you, you can't not do it. He says, I, I created and fashioned you. I breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. I designed you so you would understand and comprehend who I am. And, and I, I've blessed you with my, my goodness so that you would be delighted to worship. But it's your choice. It's your free will to say, God, I, I want to praise your name. I want to sing glory to your name. I want to live for you. I want my life to be pleasing to you. So the foundation of worship and obedience is seen here in this text that God has given us. As God carefully and wonderfully fashions man and gives him this opportunity. So we're, we're heading into a, a week set aside to give thanks to God. A time in our country, in which we shared earlier that that was set up since since 1621 that first fall after that first harvest to say wow god you've been good even in the spite of loss for a lot of them and that last year they had many of them lost loved ones but they saw god's hand they saw who he was and they chose to worship and as we go through this together the same and we see who god is we ought to be driven to worship the french have a proverb in which they state a good meal ought to begin with hunger. A good meal begins with hunger. In the same way, we've got to become hungry after God. We have to observe Him. And so when we consider the foundation of worship and start to look at who God is and His blessings in our lives, shouldn't we be hungry? Shouldn't we thirst for Him and desire us to worship Him? King David is a perfect example of the one who truly worshiped the Lord. He wrote many of the Psalms that we have in our Bible. But Psalm 63 is one of those in verses 1 through 4 where he says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. That should be the echo of every believer. To say, wow, God, my, my soul thirsts for you. I long for you. I'll seek after you. And my lips shall praise you. Hey, let me challenge you then. As you head into this Thanksgiving holiday, and, and you may have different traditions and things that you do or people's houses, I, I challenge you to take some time just personally to jot down some of the things to recognize of what God has done for you. And, and, then, and then dads in your home when you have Thanksgiving meal, why, why don't you open it up to your family and say, let's, let's share some of what God has done. What's some things that we're thankful for? Why do we want to praise God? I know we get, we want to get to the food part and we want to get to all of that stuff. But it's God who's blessed us with everything we have. And so it ought to be a drive to worship him because God is good. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for designing us with the ability to understand you, to comprehend your truth and your who you are, your character, the, the ability to, to, to have moral capability. And God, as we then see your hand of blessing in our lives, just as you with Adam and Eve delighted them by giving them the Garden of Eden and, and all the blessings of it, and to walk with you in the fellowship in the Garden. God, when I consider the the, the words of Christ, that greater love has no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. To think that you would send your only son to die on the cross, to lay his life down. He willingly laid it down because he was thinking of us. He was thinking of me. And God, you 
love us. God, I, I pray as we ponder some of those things that we will hunger and thirst for you and our lips will praise you. You are good and you're worthy of it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I ended a little bit early on purpose because as you noted in the bulletin, we wanted to this morning as well give some uh, a building um, presentation of some things that we have a building committee that's been working together for the last several months, working on some details, recognizing that God has blessed us with a, with a facility here, and sometimes it starts to show its age, and things might need remodeled, or some things uh, might need uh, added on to, or to, to help meet the needs of our church family. And so we, we, in that building committee, we talk through what are the needs, and we talk through how can we help meet those, and how can we... Um, take what God has given and God has been gracious to provide for this church family and to use that in a way that that glorifies him and so we've got a couple things we want to present to you today um, to to pray about and to consider and um, and so I'm just gonna I'm gonna start with that so we have uh, this proposal and there'll be two phases that we're looking at one is a, a fellowship hall update um, if you've noticed or been down the fellowship hall lately you'll notice that um, it's showing its age um, it's uh, it's been maintained well but things just need updated in there we're gonna discuss that in a moment and then phase two which we'll go over as well as a foyer and a drive under project which we'll explain in a moment let me just go through those two to you um, the first one would be the fellowship hall update and what we want to do is put down new flooring um, and then redo the ceiling, uh, putting in different ceiling tiles, two by two, two by two ceiling tiles, and then also taking the lights which currently hang down below the ceiling and put those up in. We're going to be doing um, LED dimmable lighting in there um, that we can, you know, if we do like, for instance, our fireside Christmas, we can dim the lights down. Um, if you're having whatever, you can change the lighting in there. Um, and so we're going to put new lighting in, new ceiling tiles. We want to paint the entire room, um, and then also then the flooring, and then that accord in the divider that goes between that and the overflow will come out, and this this um, remodel will actually carry into that overflow and into that back room as well. And so let me show you. Um, here is a, kind of a downstairs map. Here's the main fellowship hall in the yellow. Here we have the overflow, and then back in here is where we store some things. There's kitchen storage and those things. That entire area will all get remodeled and redone. That flooring will carry all the way through, ceiling lighting, all of that, and paint all the way through that whole area to really give it a nice look. We use our fellowship hall for a variety of ministry. Uh, we use it in the church. We have dinners. We're going to be down there tonight having our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we have Awanas that meets down there, Sunday school class that's in there. We use it for groups outside the church. Child Evangelism Fellowship does training exercises here. We do voting. So we've got hundreds of people from the community that come and vote in our fellowship hall. Uh, we have uh, foster parent training that takes place on Monday nights in our fellowship hall. And so people from the community are coming in there and we saw a need to help make that a nicer, more welcoming and inviting space and a durable space for that. And so a uh, new LVT flooring uh, that will be it's a it's a, a high grade of flooring very durable again the the ceiling tiles uh, like what we have in the kitchen now and also in the when we did the kitchen and also the teen room uh, two by two tiles there and then repaint the walls and so that's the that's phase one um, what we're going to be asking for and the cost estimate is for approval up to thirty thousand dollars to do that project uh, we estimate below that uh, well below that but we're asking for the approval to be up to that, to be able to do that project, to remodel all that and do that. That is going to get voted on then next Sunday evening. And so if you're a member, we'll have ballots available and we'll vote on next Sunday evening for that. That's phase one. And that we want to really then begin on um, really uh, at the beginning of the year. Start on that and get that, get that going. Phase two is regarding our foyer and drive under. Now, this is kind of hard to see 
you can see there's a little dotted line that goes here. That's our current foyer. This would be the current walls or windows and doors to the outside. Um, this would be the door that goes over to the library, and there's the wall to the offices. One of the things we want to do is we want to blow some of these walls out sideways, and so we want to make a, a hallway that will help move traffic back to the back educational wing and back over to this drive under, or I'm sorry, the, this overflow over here, and so it will take you around different ways, and so we're going to open this up, also bump this back a little bit and expand the foyer space this way. And, and then also bump out this wall into the library and move the coat rack over into this area. Take this coat rack out here. So back here will be the coats kind of out of the way and open up all of this. This will be all open and then bump this forward uh, 15 foot. So come out 15 foot to expand the foyer to give more space. You'll notice that it gets crowded in there, especially after church services. Um, I don't know if everybody has their dinner in the oven at the same time or whatever, but we say amen and people are moving through and it gets very crowded, especially at the coat racks, trying to get your stuff and get out the doors. And that doesn't encourage fellowship. We want the church family. We want you to be able to sit around and talk to each other, right? I mean, that's good. Uh, we want you to be able to spend time together, talk together and build relationships and not feel like we have to rush and get out of the way. And so we're going to open that up. We're going to move the welcome center over here um, and just open that up. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to add a drive under out here. Um, amen. Especially when you look at days where it's snowier today and we've got winter coming on. Um, that has been a concern of mine for years. Um, and I'll tell you when I actually started at the very beginning was I just moved here and I remember um, and I asked Janet if I could share this. I remember when she was getting Bill out of the, the specialized van that they had when Bill um, was handicapped. And it was pouring down the rain, like one of those sideways rains. There was four men out there trying to hold umbrellas. And they were all getting soaked. And I thought to myself, we need a drive under. And then every time it's icy and snowy out here, and I think about our, some of our older folks in the congregation and it terrifies me of you walking across an icy, slippery parking lot. And so we want to build this out to help meet your needs. Um, and we've also even talked to some of our, of our ushers and trustees who would even be there if you needed somebody to go park your car, if you drive by yourself, and so that you can come in and not have to walk across an icy parking lot. And so that is a, a project that we are currently working on. And so let me state this. Phase two isn't completed. The plans aren't done yet. But we wanted to bring it to you to say this is what our building committee is working on. We see this as a definite need for our church family. Uh, we would also be remodeling all of this all the way through even the bathrooms. Men's and women's bathrooms would all get a facelift um, and re be redone. All new flooring, ceiling, lighting, um, even some of the walls would get redone. Uh, we want to add a stone wall up here. We have our missions kiosk. And so we want to get that whole thing, a new facelift, and make that very nice as we come in. Here's an indoor, kind of an indoor rendering, and you can kind of see how that would flow. Again, these dotted lines are our current um, walls and things. Those would come out, and we would blow that out further. Um, so we're working on this. We plan in the next six months after we're, we're starting now to get plans and to get, to get some bids. Um, and we want to solidify our plans. The plans aren't even solid yet. And so we want to solidify our plans and then get blueprints and get uh, bids and then bring that back to you within the next six months with here is this, this projected proposal to the church family for consideration. And, but we want you to be praying about that. We also want you to be able to even give some input on this. And so we welcome your suggestions. There's a suggestion box in the main office at the main counter there. And so if you think, boy, I think that would be really great if we had this kind of coat rack or whatever, I, I don't know. But if you have a suggestion regarding this that you think the building committee should consider, there is little forms you can fill out and you can leave it in the box. And we'll consider that as we continue to hone uh, this project. And so this, there's no vote on this yet. This part of this is 
uh, phase two is still in the works and being uh, developed. But we want to share that with you. And then eventually phase three would be look at some things in this auditorium um, that to do some updates in here, um, changing especially some colors and those things. But again, we'll come back to that after we do phase one and phase two. And so we do have <clears throat> currently a building um, uh, fund that you're able to give to. And so we would encourage you to prayerfully consider as we look at trying to do things to help meet the needs of our church family, to encourage a place that looks nice for groups coming into our fellowship hall, for areas to, for people to fellowship out here. When we have missionary key, missionaries getting set up, it even tightens that up even further. We want to encourage fellowship out here. We want to have safety and have the drive under. Would you consider, prayerfully consider, giving a little extra to the building fund? And we want to try to raise the money for this, to do this, and, um, and be able to use God's funds in a way that would be helpful for the entire church family. And so if you'd like to give specifically the building fund, you can mark on any of your offering envelopes an amount designated to the building fund. It will all get used directly for that and, and be for that purpose. And so we wanted you to be aware of those things. Um, and I think that's the, last, that's the last slide there. So there's an update. Um, and we would like to hear your thoughts. If you have any, again, there is that suggestion box. But we will be voting on phase one for the fellowship hall next Sunday evening. And then we'll have to probably wait through the, the holidays here that, that's getting used too much um, to be able to tear into that. And so we'll wait to the beginning of the year to start on that project if it gets approved by the church family. So if you have any questions, you can see myself um, or Pastor Aaron um, and, uh, or any of the guys in the building committee. Uh, which is Doug Olson, Dave Smith, um, who else is on there, gentlemen? Greg Hargrove, um, who am I missing? Tim, Tim Leupold is on there, and also um, Tyler Foley. And so that's our building committee, and, um, oh, and Don Wilson, I'm sorry, and Don Wilson. So if you have any questions, those are the guys you can also ask any questions to, and, um, and then we also just replaced the posters out in the, in the hallway here. So if you want to see those graphics or those pictures, or the details, they'll be on the, out there on the posters. They just got hung up during the service, so you can see them there. Well, a lot to be thankful for, right? God has been good to our church family. And, and I am so thankful for what he's doing here um, and to be a part of this. And so I hope, I, I do hope that you'll come and, and be here for a time of praise together as a church family tonight. It's a, why not? We're going to have Thanksgiving food and have turkeys. I think there's six turkeys and all kinds of stuff. And so I do hope you'll plan to be here and come out for that tonight. We could use a couple guys and ladies to help set up right after the service here with tables and chairs and table decorations. Um, and then again, we'd love to see tonight. Dinner is at six o'clock. Uh, we'd love to have you there. And then if you can help, anybody can stay afterwards. Uh, to help decorate this after this service as well to help decorate for Christmas. Uh, I know the Hagans and us would appreciate that. It's always a fun time together to get the Christmas stuff out and set that up, but we'd appreciate your help also. Do, do we have any pizzas? We order any pizzas? Well, we can, can't we? <laughs> so if you're here and you say, well, I didn't have lunch yet, we'll, we'll make sure that's taken care of. So um, if you want to stay and help us with those things. Well, let me let me have prayer uh, together, and then we'll have the closing song. But let's pray on these things as we want to be unified together, and we want to glorify God through it all. So let's just pray that God would direct our church family. Th God, we thank you for the opportunity to present just some building updates and proposals. It's been a joy to see what you've allowed us to do here as a church, to build a missions house, to renovate different areas of the building, and, um, and to be able to provide for those things. As we look at the next phases of some updates, uh, I pray that you would guide us together and that there would be unity and a love and that even if our exact desires aren't, aren't, aren't met, that we would yield to each other for, for your glory. God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to do so. We pray that the, the remodeling and the building projects would be a blessing to this church family and would give us space to be able to continue to grow. And so thank you for your goodness, and thank you for this service together this morning. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing a closing song, praising and worshiping God together.